Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, wherever you are. Um, my name is Frankie Lucerto. I am from Perth, Australia. I play fourth horn in the West Australian Symphony Orchestra. I teach at the University of Western Australia, and I also teach at the West Australian Academy of Performing Arts. And I'm co-creator um, of Brass Rehab. Huge thanks to, um, to the Seattle Symphony Horns for inviting me and for putting this on and playing Konstruktstuk on the same weekend. It's amazing what you guys are doing. Um, yeah, really appreciate it. So, uh, just, yeah, where the hell is Perth? Uh, Perth is over on this side. So Sydney and Melbourne, everything on this side. So if you imagine LA to New York, it's the same distance. That's kind of the best way to explain it to people that have never heard of Perth before. So I want to start um, my talk just by telling you a story and I want you to um, <clears throat> put yourself in the shoes of, um, of the horn player in this story. So imagine for a second that, um, you know, we all have bad weeks, right? Imagine for a second that you're having another one of those bad weeks playing um, just feels a bit funny. Maybe, maybe you're a bit sore from the week before. Um, maybe things just feel really weak. Feels like you're playing on the teeth. Maybe it's just, you can't play loud or soft. You, you just kind of, you, your sound is muffled. It's hard to blow. Just, you don't know what's going on. Just another one of those weeks. Imagine for a second though, that this feeling continues to get a little bit worse, but stranger things creep in. And so your, your pitch drops almost a quarter tone. You notice um, that you're really having to use a lot of pressure just to play a middle C. Um, very strange things like this happen. Until you get to the point that this happens. Obviously, this is current, this video. So obviously, um, yeah, I, obviously from the video, you can see that I couldn't play at one point, uh, but I can play now. So what's happened here? So two, two weeks after I passed my trial with the West Australian Symphony Orchestra, I had a complete chop meltdown. Um, everything that I was telling you in the story, like pitch dropping, just weakness. I couldn't hold notes playing a C major scale. I couldn't do it. I was miming concerts uh, with the orchestra. And you know, the, the, the greater orchestra had no idea what was going on. The, the horn players around me noticed some things and the guy next to me really noticed. And, um, and it got to the point in the last concert that I played, I was miming half the concert, just playing a middle C it was a lot of work to hold it. Um, what had happened? I, I didn't know, I had no idea. Um, who do you call when something like this happens? You know, who, who would you call? Have a think about it. Who would you call? Would you call the teacher? Uh, next slide. Next slide. Who would you call? You don't want to tell your colleagues, your principal. Um, it's it's a really hard situation to be in. Luckily, in Australia, we have a doctor by the name of Dr. Bronwyn Ackerman. She is a lecturer at the University of Sydney in the School of Medical Sciences. She's a, a lecturer in anatomy. Um, and she's been specializing in musicians' health for the last 20, 25 years. She's helped hundreds of not only brass players, but wind players and string players alike. Um, she's led numerous national and international studies, uh, both here in Australia and uh, in Europe. Um, and she really um, is one of the world's best in, in this field. She 
was the person that I called straight away um, and told her about my symptoms. And from what I told her, everything that I just told you in the story, she said, it sounds like you've had an overuse injury uh, in the muscles in your face. And then she also quizzed me about my breathing and asking if I had a solid um, understanding of the foundations of the and what has to happen in breathing and creating the support that we need in playing brass instruments. Um, and from what I told her, she's like, yeah, you, you don't really know what you're doing, do you? So, oh, God, a professional player, I, th I thought I did, but obviously I don't. So she was very clear to say that this was an overuse inju injury. This is not dystonia. And we're gonna go into that a bit later. So I rang her and then I started going over to Sydney to visit her. Um, and we, I didn't play horn, I didn't wanna play horn. It's a very emotional journey that you go through when you have an injury. Uh, for two months, we just talked about breathing and we did some strengthening in the face, which I'm gonna show you today. And then Couple months after that, started playing again. Then within six months, I went back to the orchestra playing full time, better than I had before. So my question to you is, how is this possible to learn French horn from scratch from a physio? How can we learn how to play brass from someone that has never played a note on a brass instrument? Think about that for a minute. There, there is a lot to this, and this is what me and Bromman are trying to change in the brass world um, through brass rehab and talk about the anatomy and how we can use it to our advantage and not detriment. So you often hear the paralysis by analysis, but I, I think we can use this information for good. You can add this information to whatever you do in your playing. And that's what we're going to do today. What we know from the research is, so this is an Australian study, this top one, that 70% of all musicians will face some kind of career threatening injury at some point in their career. So it's a big um, statement, but it's a very large kind of um, um, group of people that were um, analyzed here. Uh, similar studies that have been done in Europe, um, in Finland, 30% of, so this is of uh, injured wind and brass players, 30% were facial, 54% were jaw. Uh, and in Germany, another similar study of all the brass players, 58% had some kind of facial jaw problems at some point in their career, and almost 10% were unable to work because of these problems at either the time or for the rest of their career. So there's no hiding from this. So traditionally, players would just quit or they would be swept under the carpet or, um, but it's not the case anymore. You, you can recover from most injuries, I would argue. So this is what sparked my interest and journey in, into this area. Obviously this happened to me about eight years ago. And ever since I've been working with Brahman to help people all around the world, brass, um, so French horn players, trumpet players, trombone players, um, recover from injuries just like I went through. So where are we going? I'm sorry about the slides. They're gonna make your eyes bleed at some point um, in this presentation, but uh, just bear with me. It's, it's the thought that counts. Um, where are we going? So we're gonna be splitting this talk up into two main areas. So breathing and the embouchure, and then we're gonna have time for Q and A at the end. For the first half, I wanted, um, I've created a, from everything that I learned with Brahman and everything that we need, to involve and know about in anatomy for breathing, I've created um, it into a, an acronym called the best breath. And this, we're able to do this uh, and slow it right down to a certain rhythm that we're gonna go through. But what it does is breaks down uh, what's involved in breathing, where to feel it and how to access it. And uh, that, so it just gives you a great um, understanding of of what is actually happening when we breathe and when we create air pressure. This is really important to talk about because not only is it the first thing that usually goes when we're nervous in performing, but also when, when someone is, is injured, usually their breathing and their support goes out the window because they're so focused on why is it not working? Why is it not working? They, everything falls apart for them, especially breathing and support. So, Next slide. 
So the best breath. So this is uh, this is something I created that, yeah, like I said, goes through the, the steps in preparation just before we play anything on the French horn. So B stands for blob, E stands for expand, S for support, and T for tongue. So blob. Uh, I can't see all your faces, but I would um, just ask you, know, who's heard of the diaphragm before? All of you would put your hands up. Um, we've, we've all heard of the diaphragm. Teachers in the past have used, you know, used the diaphragm, support from the diaphragm. But what does this actually mean? Um, what I want to kind of do here is, uh, uh, if you've watched the show Myth, Mythbusters, I want to kind of go explore the diaphragm in that kind of way, because it's kind of unhelpful, these comments of use your diaphragm, support from your diaphragm. The diaphragm is not that kind of muscle, and I want to explain to you why. So here is a picture of the diaphragm. You see it's a dome-shaped uh, muscle that's just below the lungs and connected to the lungs, but it's also above all of our guts. Um, and it's connected to the, to the lower part of the ribs. So much like the heart, um, the diaphragm is actually kind of half involuntary. So when we're asleep, when we're everyday breathing, it just does its job. It, it contracts to lower down and pull the lungs down, pull air into the body, and then it, it relaxes to its resting position, going up to exhale. And so throughout the day and through the night, this will do this without us even thinking about it. But we, we can tell you, you can tell yourself, okay, I want to breathe in now. And, and for everyday breathing, this is, so it's, you can see how it's half involuntary, but we can half talk about it. But the thing that we can't do, we can't feel its current position. So like the heart, we know that it's going, you can feel it um, beating, but you can't feel its position. With the diaphragm, you can't control it in that way. Like your arm, you know what position your arm is in, you know, what position other muscles are in the diaphragm you, you cannot feel it you can tell it to work but you can't feel it so this is very important to to understand what we can do is use muscles and organs around the diaphragm to move it in extreme ways um, that we need to as brass players um, everyday breathing is very different to the breathing that we need to do you know before a big passage or something and, and so um, so when we lie down and you, and you breathe, you'll notice one thing that moves, you, your belly will go up and, and down when you're lying down. This is because as the lungs go down, the ribs expand, the diaphragm goes down, it pushes all of our guts down. And then our guts only have one way to go, our belly goes up. And so what uh, my, my big argument with, with um, how we can move the diaphragm around is that we can use the guts to our advantage with moving the diaphragm. So what we're able to do with the help of gravity and good posture is actually blob our guts out. So you can see, I don't have much of a gut, but we can really push our bellies out, relaxed, falling down and off our spine, if you could imagine. And what that does is pulls the diaphragm down and which pulls the lungs down about an American inch. And what that does is suck a little bit of air into the lungs. So it's not a big movement. I'm not saying it's breathing as we know it, but it's just like a, a, like a ripcord on a lawnmower. It gets things started. It gets things moving in the right direction. It sets our lungs up for the most um, uh, potential capacity that we can. So I want everyone to stand up and, and just give this a go. So stand up, put your hand on your belly. What I want you to do is, is go to start a breath, but at the same time, really relax your stomach and really just let it blob out, really let it push out. And remember, the confusing thing is that the, the belly out is air in. So let's just do this a couple of times. So you might be able to hear um, air coming in and out of my mouth just, just by doing this. 
So I'm not physically trying to breathe. I'm controlling this just with the gravity of all my guts pulling down, just going down. I mean, you're not holding anything. You're just dropping it and leaving your throat open and stuff. So this is the first step of the best breath. And we're going to add this um, to other things. So you notice here, this is just a short um, GIF, just showing you the relationship between diaphragm and the pelvic floor and the way that the guts are. So that we get the diaphragm and the pelvic floor moving in sync almost as the diaphragm goes down, it pushes the guts down, which pushes the pelvic floor down. Pelvic floor is, we're going to, ex we're going to explore that in a second. Um, but for now, we'll go on to the next one. So that's B. B is for blob. E, e is for expand. So expanding, oh, expanding the rib cage uh, very much out, very much uh, in, not so much forward, although the rib cage and everything does move out this way, but we, we really want to focus on extending our rib cage outwards. This is something Sarah Willis publicly talks about when she breathes, she just thinks about this motion. One thing I want you to know is um, uh, just the position of the lung. So if I play this video for you, this is something we don't always think about as brass players, but when the lungs come in in a second, you'll notice how high they are. They start not at the bottom of the ribs, just about the third rib up, and they go up to our collarbone and just above. So it's actually quite high, quite a little bit higher than you would often uh, hear people talking about. Um, and a really important thing for women to understand uh, about this, so men have larger lung capacities than women, but women have 10% more movement sideways. And this is because during late pregnancy, obviously your body is taken up by a human and you need you need a way to breathe, you need a way to survive. So women are naturally designed to have 10% more rib motion than men. So for women, this is super important that you get a, an understanding and a feeling of, um, of your rib movement. So this, this motion happens at the same time as the blob. So if you can imagine, I'm gonna show you a video of, of the timing of this. You'll notice, um, and again, sorry for making your eyes bleed. Uh, you'll notice I've got a elastic around my rib cage. So that's that's to really just to feel. So what we can do is we can all do this again. You can sit down or you can stand up. But what I want you to do is breathe, just do an exhale and really push on your ribs with your hands and see if you can really feel that expansion outwards. So we're gonna do it a couple of times like in this video. So if you can all stand up and just do it along with the video, you'll hear a metronome if that's helpful. But you'll see the belly comes out just before or just at the same time as the rib cage. So what's happening is we're blobbing down, we're pulling the lungs down and then they're at a low position, giving the lungs full potential and capacity to be able to just for the ribs to swing open. Now keep keep breathing there for me. And so you your hands have been down at the bottom of your rib cage, but I want you to also breathe for me and put your hands up in your armpits. And you'll notice there's also movement there. Now shoulders are going to raise a little bit naturally, but there's no, it's not the same as using your muscles to raise your shoulders. Naturally, as because our lungs are up here, our ribs are moving up here, there's got, always going to be a little bit of natural movement of your shoulders. So don't always be afraid of it. Movement in your shoulders, just make sure that it's the, the right kind of movement. Let's do that one more time, just together, just putting your hands on your ribs. This is something you can do in the practice room, maybe not in the orchestra, um, is take your right hand out of the bell and just keep it on your rib cage as you're breathing in, as you're playing. Uh, next slide. 
So that's what we were doing. So if you were to imagine um, the timing, if you were to put a rhythm. So this rhythm, we're going to be do, adding a couple more things to. You'll notice that it's a different rhythm to the, what's in the videos because um, in the videos, I was using a rebreathing bag to stop from passing out. But make sure when you're doing any breathing exercise, you leave a good gap or a chair behind you so you don't pass out. So B is for blob, E is for expand, S is for support. So we've all heard, uh, we've all been screamed at, you know, support, support, use your support. But what does it actually mean? How do you actually feel it? Where do you feel it? How do you feel it? Uh, how do you know if it's working or not? Um, support ultimately comes from the pelvic floor. Um, the pelvic floor can be a, a tricky group of muscles to find um, as it's not like our abdominal muscles or another muscles where, where you can really clench it and really feel that um, strength in it. it. It's more of a dull um, activation. If it, if it was. So the, the pelvic floor is, uh, yeah, let's go into it. So what I want you to think about, what we're going to be able to do with the pelvic floor is like what this woman is doing here. She's blowing into a balloon. And imagine for a second that you're blowing to this balloon, but at the same time, like she is, you're, you're pushing the balloon up while you're still blowing air into it. So what you're going to feel is you're, you're blowing air, you're going to feel air velocity coming into the balloon. But if you pushed back, you would feel air pressure coming back at you. You'd feel back pressure. What we're able to do with the pelvic floor is exactly this. So as we breathe in, at the top of the breath, we're actually able to activate the pelvic floor which in turn pushes up on the guts, which pushes up on the diaphragm, which pushes up onto the lungs to create air pressure that's going to come out of our bodies at a, at a, um, a faster rate. So let's look at it a sec what the pelvic floor is. So here's the pelvic floor. It's a, it's a group of muscles that are mostly, uh, their, their main job is for, uh, to, to assist in um, defecation and urination. Uh, so the stopping and starting of, of those two things. Uh, another muscle I want to show you is the transverse abdominis, um, which is more what we're going to access um, and is closely linked to the pelvic floor. It's part of the, the family of the pelvic floor. So the beauty about the transverse abdominis is that it can't be activated without activating the pelvic floor. Uh, another reason why the transverse abdominis is so good is because we can actually get some visual and physical cues from it, where, whereas the pelvic floor is a little bit, like I said before, it's, it's a little bit more vague in its feeling. You don't always know if you're doing it correctly. So I want to show you a technique that's borrowed from um, a movement called accent breathing method. This is um, a method that's used to teach people that have had strokes how to speak again. And they don't do it by using words. They do it by um, finding these support muscles and making sounds with different kinds of resistance. So noises like s, v, n, and z. So th these are all um, sounds that, we, that create resistance up here that we need to create support to get past so we can do the same thing with um with brass playing uh so i want you all to you can either stand i have to stand up so i can show you but what i want you to do is find so like in the picture you see the hip there and then you see the bottom of the rib cage i want you to feel your top of the hip top of your hip on the side of your body the bottom of your rib cage and then there's this squishy valley in the middle so I want you to find that bit really on the side of you. So there's hip, rib in there. And I want you all to cough while you and put quite a bit of pressure on here and cough. <coughs> <coughs> and so you'll see, for me, the hands really shoot out. You should be able to feel that as well. This is the transverse abdominis. You'll notice when you do it, it's not like crunching your abs. It's not a real... Um, the crunching feeling it's more of a holistic just core activation 
if you put your hand there again and pretend like you're going to the toilet, you'll notice the same thing that it that it pops out. Um, so this is what we're going to add now to um, the exercise that we've been doing in just a sec after we talk about the tongue. So this, um, yeah, let's go into tongue first. So I added tongue at the end mostly because I needed to create an acronym, but uh, also, I mean, it's important to talk about um, the mechanics of the tongue and I'm not gonna go too much into, into the tongue because I know there are very different schools about tonguing, um, but what we do know about the tongue through the great work of Eli Epstein, I'm sure you've all seen pictures like this and his live MRI pictures are happening. We now get a great idea of how the, the, the back of the tongue especially naturally changes its shape to assist uh, in the in the um, like the air pressure in, inside the mouth for different registers and the way that it um, changes the cavity size. Um, and so he talks about different octaves and stuff being different levels of a building. And um, there's really fascinating pictures and stuff. So obviously the, the tongue starts at the behind the top teeth where the gum is we blow it out of the way. So a tonguing is a release, not an attack. So and then just returns to that point. But double tonguing, the tongue goes like like that. It, the two contact points, front of the tongue, middle of the tongue. And it, with the air pressure behind it, it kind of flips like this. So now what I want to show you is how we can put all of this together uh, to a rhythm. So you'll see that rhythm on the page. I just want to play you the video once. And so the, the, because I've got a rebreathing bag, it'll, it's the same rhythm, but without the rest. So just, just be mindful of that. Two, three, breathe, set, tongue. Two, three, breathe, set, tongue. Two. Blob, set, tongue. Two, three. Breathe, set, tongue. So I hope you can see how this works. We can actually, there, there can be a very good flow to our preparation. Obviously, this is at quarter note. I think I've got that right. Equals 50. So it's slow, but you, I'm sure as musicians, you can see how this can be sped up into any or slowed down into any. Um, speed. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions about this. There always is, but um, yeah, I implore you to uh, add this to whatever you think about breathing and stuff and just try and think about this. You can think about it in the car or while you're playing um, whatever floats your boat. So let's, let's try that together. So just ignore, just use the metronome in the video, but ignore what I'm doing. But see if we can, so the, the breathe on the first 16th note, I think that's right, um, eighth note, eighth note. Um, the first eighth note is the blob and expand. Then the last, the last eighth note before the bar line is the set. So that setting of the support and then tongue. So just playing. So let's just do this a little bit around the circle. Two, three. Cool. We should move on, but I hope you understand that. So the embouchure. This is what we're here to talk about mostly. So what is the embouchure? In its simplest form, the embouchure is this middle muscle here, the ubicularis oris, wanting to do this. That's all it wants to do in life is it's, it's a sphincter. So it's like the eye socket or the anus, it just wants to close. So it's that. And then we've got all these other muscles, if you can see on the, on the picture, the zygomaticus muscles coming up away from it, like a spider web or like a circus tent. They want to, pull up and the ones below the lip 
pulling down. So all they want to do is really stretch the lips across the face. They, they want to stretch the lips across the teeth like this. And then the embouchure is a natural uh, tug of war in between those two movements. So there's a bit of this, there's a bit of that. And then the middle ground is what we know as the embouchure. Obviously the body wasn't invented to play brass instruments, but this is um, what it is. The great Philip Farkas um, was bang on about this. Uh, the way that he, I'm sure you've all seen these pictures in his book, The Art of Brass Playing. He likens the jaw and the teeth to a, a tin can and the lips and the face and the muscles to this canvas bag with the drawstring. So you'll see in figure six, he's got the drawstring fully um, tight. So he that represents the auricularis, just like I was talking about. Then he stretches it with his hands. That's like all these muscles away from the auricularis. And then in this final picture, the perfect balance. So Philip Farkas was on about the exact same thing. Um, just didn't go into as much detail. Is, is there a perfect embouchure? No, of course there isn't. We're all different. We all have different shaped faces. We all have different symmetry in our faces, but there are general rules about um, the muscles that we all use the same muscles and there, there should be a, a good balance in the muscles that we use. I'll just talk a bit about um, the, the balance that different brass instruments use. So as horn players, what we know from research is this, the ubiquilarosaurus is, takes most of the load between 60 and 70% or safer to say majority of the load. So this is so important for horn players. And these muscles, I don't know if you can see behind the deepest muscles in here, the buccinators. These are what we're talking about when we talk about our corners. These really, their job is to hug the cheek against the teeth. They're our corners. And they also hold together a meeting point called the modialis here, where all pretty much every muscle involved in the embouchure meet. So it also means like the hub of a wheel. Um, and so the buccinator's job is to hold them in place. So this is when we're talking about corners, we really want to be talking about these called the buccinators. Uh, I'll talk briefly about injury. Um, so what does an injury look like, feel like, what to look out for? So in my overuse injury, I didn't have any pain, but for some people, they experience pain. So in injuries, you can have pain. You, sometimes you don't have pain. There can be different kinds of pain, like shooting pain where you really feel like a lightning bolt somewhere, or it can be aching pain where it can feel like just always fatigue uh, or clotting. So like if you feel a little nub somewhere in your lip, uh, like it's literally a, a small blood clot that's happening. You can feel weakness, just like, like I said, when I had my injury as playing on the teeth, uh, you can have shaking, which can be uh, yeah, anywhere, or it can be a tremor, or you can have physical scarring where you can, like, you see some, you see it mostly in trumpet plays, you'll see like scars. This is because of teeth that have, uh, like protruding teeth that have interrupted the lip. Um, I will touch briefly on overuse first dystonia. So focal dystonia is one of the only words that you see kind of being thrown around the brass world. Uh, this is because, uh, th this is just the only thing that um, players know mostly to, to associate with an injury. A dystonia is a neurological disorder. It's, it's not muscular. It affects the muscles, but it's neurological. Whereas an overuse industry is overuse to, to a muscle. What we know from recent research is, so before, yeah, so the, the two are, are very different, but from recent research, we actually know that they're a little bit closer linked than we originally thought. So this is a study um, out of Germany by the amazing um, Eckhart Altenmuller. Um, what he's showing here is just that basically an overuse inju injury can evolve over time into a dystonic injury. Uh, this is his argument and, and um, they're working a lot at the moment um, 
on this whole area of medical science based on this. But sometimes dystonia can be genetic and can come from nowhere. So uh, I'm not saying that overuse will definitely turn to dystonia, but there's, there's, it's blurred, like there's no definitive um, that this will happen, this is dystonia, this is overuse. I, I believe dystonia is overdiagnosed and I believe a lot of people are just suffering from overuse and overuse is much easier to treat than um, dystonia. So now we're gonna have a bit of fun and go around the face and uh, isolate all these muscles and see what movement they do and why they're really important in brass playing. It's no use me telling you this anatomical information if we can't actually uh, ask ourselves, well, why is that actually important to playing? So we're gonna start at the top. So we see these mus muscles here, levitator larvae superioris, either side of the nose. What these muscles want to do is uh, like, like you've smelt something really bad or like a snarl. So if everyone can have a go at that, look, get nice and close to your cameras and do that. And then next to that, we have the zygomaticus minor, which wants to do this. So not everyone can do these, but a lot of people can do one side and not the other, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. So these are going really, like you're pulling a piece of string just from very far away. Good. The next one is, so the zygomaticus major. So this is like the um, not so sincere smile, like the fake smile. So it's just like tugging the corner of the mouth It's like the, yeah, sure. That's that one. Uh, we will talk about the buccinator in a second. Then we've got um, the depressor anguli oris, which does this, the sad face. Then we have the depressor labe inferioris. So this is like that one, but the opposite. The, It's very important with these that there's no chin movement. So this is what really pats your lip out. And if you combine those two together, these two, you get this. This is my son doing the perfect sad baby face, which is these two muscles working at the same time. Very sad. And then we have the mentalis, which is what a lot of brass players talk about is keeping the chin flat. And it's important to notice how deep that is. So it really folds behind not only these muscles coming down here, the depressor labia inferioris, but also up behind the abicularis oris. So if you can imagine the, the embouchure like a circus tent, um, where you know this this thing is stretched across this frame with all these ropes if you cut one or two ropes then other muscles other ropes have to work harder to keep everything um stretched enough and this is where injury comes into it so when one muscle is not doing its job properly other muscles around it have to work super hard to make up for those for the the weaker muscle and then that then then they are prone uh, to injury. Um, I want to talk about, yep. Yeah. So I want to talk about the top lip quickly. This, um, the top lip is not something that we talk about a lot in brass playing. We're often talking a lot about the corners, which is great, the chin, which is great. But the top lip, its insertion to the head is, is to the skull, whereas the bottom lip its insertion is into the jaw. So this is really important to know because the, um, just in terms of the role that they both have. And we also know from research that the muscle fibers in the, in the bottom half of the ubicularis oris uh, are much more dynamic than the top half. So this is because just the mobility, the movement that the bottom lip has. So this, the top lip is it's 
role in general and i know some of you will disagree with this and that's fine but it's its role is to be the firm foundation of the embouchure that it, it doesn't move much it just stays strong and the bottom lip because it's connected to the joy its job is to roll out and in and strengthen it this way to change the shape of the aperture and because of the influence of the jaw to change register and everything so i would argue that those are the two roles of the top lip and bottom lip even though they're the same muscle they're kind of broken up into quadrants um so what are, if if you can walk away from today with anything this next exercise is so important for horn players uh, this is how you strengthen your orbicularis oris so this is great if you're on tour uh it doesn't matter it, you don't have to be injured to do this it, like i do this all the time i do this in the car whenever i'm driving no don't do that um what you're going to see in this video is uh so like that shape i was showing you the orbicularis oris wants to do this what I've got is I've just got a normal toothpick and I've wet the toothpick and I'm just trying to grip onto the toothpick with my lips and then trying to pull it out just with the friction of my fingers. So you notice the toothpick's not so important. It's just like a little game that we play um, to have something to focus on really gripping this way. But you're not using any other muscles, just, just really rolling your lips out like this. So we can all do this together now. But just imagine you have a toothpick. So really hold that form. Yeah. You don't have to time this or anything. It, I mean, it'll be like a, you'll, you'll know, you want to do it until you start to feel this lactic acid building up. And you'll know the feeling. It feels like you've played a Marlis symphony. You, you should feel it even just kind of aching. And I would suggest not doing this during or before or after a practice session, do this away from the horn. This is a great thing to do in the car, on the toilet, um, in class, in rehearsal, no, not in rehearsal, sorry, in a, in a full company meeting. Um, this is really important for horn, but if you can walk away from anything, even if you thought the rest was crap, I want you to take this away and really use this to your advantage. This will keep you so strong. So I didn't, play, like I told you in my injury story, I didn't play for six months and I came back to the orchestra and playing in a three hour rehearsal was fine. And I'd only for six months, I'd been playing 10, 20 minutes a day max. And then because of this exercise alone, I was able to go back to work 100%. Just a quick, um, yeah, so like we were talking about um, the corners. So if you look at number seven in this image, um, the buccinate, it's actually, it's not quite accurate. It's a little bit wider than that. I just want you to feel what, so there, I was talking about the buccinate, they're the deepest muscle in the face. Often as brass players, like I used to, we think of the corners on a skin level, but the, this is the deepest muscle that we want to really um, work on. So everybody, Get your finger and we're going to put your finger in your mouth and put it to about here inside the cheek. And what you're going to see me do is, is really squish my finger against my teeth. So I'm really squishing it against my teeth. Have your teeth touching but not clenching. And you really feel it's quite a strong action. So everyone can do that sort of thing. You feel like your finger is cupped at first and then it's like space bagged. It's really squished against your teeth. This is the buccinator. So if you're ever unsure about where your corners are, you really want to feel this, like your cheeks are wrapping against your teeth because that's the action that that muscle does. And that's what this is all about, is learning what the action is, what their role is and why they're so important. And also <clears throat> back to the chin, just why it's important, because uh, we all talk about having a flat chin. Again, it's a, a deeper muscle. And so the, the strength from the bottom to the bottom lip, these muscles can't work properly unless they have a solid foundation underneath it, keeping everything out of the way. So 
so this muscle wants to stretch down and these want to go down as well but they're fighting against this so every, all of these muscles in the face are working like a tug of war because this wants to go down but the ubiquitous wants to come up the halfway point is strength just like everything else in the embouchure that we've talked about um Again, with the top lip, it, this is a tricky one because we're told the students, you know, to pout to, uh, and if, and I have been told to pout when I play, the action that you want to do is, is this, but you're actually not, you're, you're actually doing the opposite of strengthening the top lip because as we know, we need a combination, not only of this by itself, but you, you can't play horn like that, but we need, the others as well. So the top lip is strongest when it's actually flat and then with corners next to it kind of strengthening it. So if you can imagine it's like a sheet of metal, you put two bricks next to it and what's going to happen to the sheet, sheet metal? It's going to pop forward. So the pout should come not from doing this, but from flat and then adding corners in. So it, it does the same thing. It pops forward, but not, not like foam, but like tire rubber, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, and, and so one last thing I want to talk about is preparation. So preparation is so important. It's something that if you're a healthy horn player, you don't think about it at all. But with 90% of injured brass players that I see, they're the idea of preparation has gone out the window. So sometimes they're actually able to form an embouchure off the instrument, but when they bring the instrument to them, their body, their mind just freaks out. Their body wants to help so much and they're just unable to form it just with a piece of metal touching. So one really important thing that I've discovered through this whole process is just this idea of preparation. A lot of musicians, a lot of horn players talk about this and do this, but they don't talk about it in this way, but I, you see them doing it. So like Stefan Dor or Andrew Bain, um, many, many great players before they play will snap. You'll see this, they snap into place before they play. So like when we whistle, if you go to whistle, you notice what the face does. It prepares, doesn't it? And in a very similar way to the embouchure, you see the out, these outside muscles prepare so that this can have the right shape and the right funnel. We want to do the same thing. And funnily enough, this can happen at the same time as support. So in the best breath, the breathe, set, tongue, breathe. So that is all I got. And I want to now open it up to some q and A. I've already got a couple in here, which is great. So. Uh, Josiah said, I've seen some trumpet players refer to a pencil or chopstick exercise. How comparable is your toothpick exercise to those? Yeah, so again, the, so these chopsticks or um, like the peat thing, they, they kind of use all the muscles because you're pulling the, the other way, but you're kind of just doing the same as you would be doing playing trumpet. What I'm doing is different. It's really isolating the muscle and just just that one muscle, whereas the peat or chopsticks are, are doing a combination of muscles at the same time. So it's closer to, to playing. But what we know from research is that horn players really rely on this. So it's actually more efficient if you're isolating that one muscle. Uh, Harry Bell, is it common to need to adjust the embouchure due to changing tooth alignment as we age? Te teeth can have a huge impact on our embouchure, um, even so if people lose a tooth, it can really throw everything out of whack. Or if people get a coating changed on their tooth or, or um, often with braces, it's usually kids that have braces and they're kind of too young to be worrying about this kind of stuff and they get on with it and they bleed and no one cares and it's fine, which is maybe a good attitude to have. But yeah, anything that happens to the teeth can often have a huge impact because you've got this um the the muscles are used to this certain surface area and, th and this is why it's so important to be confident with the process of what has to happen here 
so that you're not relying on if something goes, if a tooth leaves, then it's all thrown out of whack. I've, I've retrained people that have lost teeth and you just have to get the confidence back here, not how it's feeling on the teeth. So great question. Uh, Anonymous says, how much time does it take most people to recover from their injury? Depends how long they've gone on with their injury for. So for me, it happened two weeks and straight away I was onto it. So I was able to recover much quicker. But I've had clients that have been um, playing, but knowing that there's something wrong for years and lots of bad habits get in the way. And so it, it takes longer to recover. Um, I would say six months for like, for me, that is a relatively quick recovery, but from the video that you saw, but not everyone is at that point. Not everyone is that bad. So you can't really say it really depends on the person, um, on how much they want it. Like it's very stressful. And if someone, if a player has got a family, they have to support, uh, yeah, it's, it's an emotional roller coaster. So great question. How do we make out the difference between a bad day and an injury? Um, yeah, so a, a bad day, we all, we all get bad days. It doesn't matter, like every player gets a bad day. You ask anyone, they, they will always have a bad day. And you can obviously attribute it like, oh, did you do a lot of playing the day before, the week before, that week, that morning? Um, and the thing to do, you, know, you always go back to basics. So rest is the most important thing. Rest, 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 rest. Making sure you're drinking water and stuff. But you'll you'll know if things are are really getting bad. Like if they go on for a week, two weeks, or um, often it's something you're neglecting, or it it depends on the person. Uh, what have been the biggest differences with horn, trumpet, trombone, with their embouchure muscle loads and any trends with what has been the biggest issues in specific instruments injuries? So what, um, I don't know if you can all see those questions, but basically what has been the biggest difference in injuries presented between the brass instruments? Um, usually support has been a big thing. But often the top lip strength has been a big thing for people that have just kind of yeah, gripped into their top lip or pressed into it without actually giving it any strength. This is where I see most injuries, not only in horn, but trumpet and trombone, where, where the muscle is not pushing back on the mouthpiece with the same pressure that's being put on it. Um, that's where I would see the biggest injuries and support. Support is always... Um, an issue. Is it possible to pull a muscle in the embouchure? Uh, yes and no. Um, it's possible to definitely like damage a muscle, but it, it's not it, like it's definitely, I wouldn't say pull it, like we pull muscles in the leg and stuff because they're, they're such a they're at such angles and they're, they're literally be able to, they're able to be pulled off their insertion or something. But so it's not pull a muscle, but definitely like do slight damage to a muscle. So like, um, yeah, I'm gonna get back to that. Similar to the bad day question, what's some good advice for the few days of it? Few, first few days of a heavy playing cycle, 10 shows a week, how to prepare, how to minimize and mitigate injury. Yeah, great question. So obviously swelling can come into it. Um, knowing that you have yeah, that 10 shows a week coming up. So this toothpick exercise is so important um, uh, away from the horn. Um, also doing a mixture of, so after a show, you can do a mixture of icing the chops and then something warm on it. So icing it for a bit, and then putting something warm on it, that really helps the muscles in their recovery. Um, also, you're yeah, drinking plenty of water. And um, in shows like that, like knowing where you can um, take a break a little bit. So knowing where, you know, in tutti sections where you can, anything that you can do to um, bring the load back a little bit is always possible, I think. Uh, how do you judge how much mouthpiece pressure to use? Yeah, so like I said briefly before, 
you want to kind of be using this pressure is your friend like not excess pressure but we need a little bit of pressure to create a seal don't we i mean the, and i'm not the first person to say pressure is your friend um Farkas, you know, he, he took back what the, those experiments he did with the horn on the piano and stuff because of this. So um, I would say you, you want the same pressure pushing on the mouthpiece as you're putting onto it. So if you're pushing against your hand, you want to be pushing the hand with the same thing, but you always want it off the teeth. So I always liken it to like um, that feeling of when players are healthy, they feel like it's like tire rubber. It's not a, a solid material it's rubbery but it's quite solid um so keeping it keeping it off the teeth but strong uh Lynette, i had an obvious injury years ago which resulted in a tremor in the top lip and occasionally i still get one but can usually move my lips inwards like you were showing and it goes away is an occasional shake also a result of overuse or maybe a support issue yeah so this usually happens when, if I've taught, if I've rebuilt someone's embouchure, so sometimes their sound, especially in the middle low register, will be shaky. And it's not because a muscle is shaking, it's because they have this, this framework for the first time in a long time, and they're using the same air, but their air can't do what it's meant to so that they, they need to they, all of a sudden this is confident enough that there's no air coming through so once they put more air through that shake goes away then i would yeah it depends where the shake is coming from if it's a like a if you ever see I, not many people have seen a dystonia patient or what dystonia looks like but it's a like it's a, an aggressive shaking it's like a it's very noticeable and a tremor is not always a bad thing but um it's it depends on the person but i know you Lynette, and i love you so maybe we'll catch up sometime you can show me uh did you learn everything you've presented from the specific physio you've mentioned or are there specific courses or classes one can take to continue this education so yeah so i've learned mostly from my journey and with Broman, but also there are some, but there's not much literature. I mean, there's there's studies. I've read a lot of studies, especially out of uh, Germany, uh, uh, like Lucinda Lewis, who's an American horn player who has done uh, a lot of, um, she's written a book on embouchure uh, rehabilitation. That's the only book that I know of that's written on the subject. So a little bit from her, a little bit from, bits and pieces from everywhere. Um, but me and Bronwyn, the woman that um, is the co um founder of Brass Rehab, we're, we're creating an online course for education. So watch this space because um, we're, we're going to be doing it specifically for, for yeah, medical professionals. Because um, if you were ever to see the guidelines for a doctor, especially in Australia, for dystonia, it's half a page long. It says if someone presents with dystonia, this like uh, one of their um, instructions is you know, explore um, Botox. And this, no one has ever come out and said, oh, Botox was the thing that helped it. You know, it's madness that you would put Botox into your lips. Um, but yeah, anything else? Thanks, Lynette, love you. I really appreciate all these questions. It feels very strange um, talking to nobody. Oh, uh, there's another one. Do you work with clients from outside Australia? Someone asked. Yes, I mostly work with clients outside of Australia because Perth is the most isolated city in the world. Um, so yeah, oh, I'm being told to leave. Thank you all so much for checking in. Thank you so much, bye. Thank hey, John. All right. Hello, that was great. What a great. As a tuba player, I really appreciated the um, the breathing part. That was excellent. That was, yeah, that was yeah so it's cool. even with tuba players who have to breathe so much more. It, it's amazing how many times tuba players are like, "What? What? I've never heard this. What? Yeah. What is this?" Yeah, so. yeah, it's so good, and it's a good. It's gonna honestly it'll help me with my students the way you explained it because I do that, but I guess I didn't realize I was pushing my stomach out as much and what was happening. That was really really excellent. So thanks for that. And I, yeah, I got so much from that class. So everyone, right. never about. 
we have about three minutes, two minutes or so until the uh, SSL Horn concert. Uh, I put a link in the chat. It's getting buried here, so I'm going to post it again. If you, I know you all probably have it, but head over to YouTube. There's the link. Uh, yeah, and watch that concert. And then um, at 8 p.m., the Seattle Symphony Live will uh, will have the concert struck, and I will post links for that too if you need that. Uh, so yeah, great. Thank you so much. That was I really enjoyed that. Thanks. Thanks, Mike.